I'm sure people bring up the funny how scene quite a lot. The funny house? Funny how. <laughs> funny? Oh, the funny how. Funny how. Yes, now that came actually, mm -hmm. that's good fellas, and that actually came from something that, I, that happened to Joe Pesci. Funny how. I mean, what's funny about it? <laughs> Tommy, no, you got it all wrong. Oh, oh, Anthony. He's a big boy, he knows what he said. What'd you say? You're right. Funny how. I heard it was, I'm not gonna say not scripted, but it was semi-improvised. Let me put it this way. He described the, the incident to me. We then rehearsed it several times. Okay. Wrote it up in different versions and then composed the scene from those rehearsals. So it was scripted in that sense uh, with a frills here and there. Okay. <laughs> and, and now it's a classic. Yeah. Tell me what's funny. Get the fuck out of here, Tommy. <laughs> I almost had him. I almost had him. <laughs> yeah, stuttering prick yet. More recently, the Wolf of Wall Street chest bumping scene. That, yes, now that was a total improvisation. The name of the game. How kitty? I think I see Leo just glancing maybe mm -hmm. at you to check. Mm -hmm. No, I think he was looking around because he was mortified. <laughs> Who is this man? What am I doing here? Come on. With a common denominator. But you know, Leo came to me and he said, do you see what, what um, Matthew's doing? Oh. He seems to be humming a lot. I said, why is he humming? Why is he humming? Keep it up on me. Oh. I got up and I listened. And I said, what's he doing? I guess, from what I understand, it's an acting exercise. It's a one-way street. Whichever way I go. In terms of getting his voice and tone. Mm -hmm. And so I went up to him and said, why don't you just play with that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> Leo. <laughs> that was ultimately an improvisation that uh, uh, I think was only in the second week of shooting that we, we finally realized uh, we could go anywhere with the picture. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, speaking of which, how did you imagine the Quaalude scene going? Oh, no, that, that uh, pretty much as, as shot. Hey, boy, what's up? It's me. What's going on? I'm going to pay for him. What's going on? Well, he melts completely. <laughs> he melts on the phone. And he melts first in his dialogue. I can't understand. Say that again. I said, well, I want to scream on this ride. What the fuck are you saying? And we have Bo Deedles on the other side of the phone saying, are you stoned? Are you fucking high? I can't move. I need to move the eye. Are you high or something? He goes, no, I'm not. You can understand what he's saying. Don't get behind the wheel of the car. I'm going to pick you up. John! Mortifying. Absolutely mortifying. John! Uh, <sighs> opening the car door. Well, opening the car door, I had in mind that he would crawl across the ground mm -hmm. and open the car door and get in the car. But um, when I chose the car, I, I really liked that car that, that we had. I forget what it was, but uh, I realized <laughs> too late that the door opened up. So I looked at Leo and I said, what are we gonna do? I said, you still have to open the door. He says, I'll use my foot. It's really Jacques Tati or Jerry Lewis. Yeah. He's extraordinary mm -hmm. uh, in mimicking and uh, like almost a mime mm. in, in his uh, body. And he had actually, interestingly enough, because he fell back in the previous shot and kind of knocked his back out a bit. Uh, so what you see there is very real. <laughs> wow. Sometimes it's a bit of acting and a bit of reality. Yes, exactly. Frank Sheeran, is that right? Yeah, you said right. Uh, under the contract, management can only fire a driver on very specific charges. So, you ever show up late? No. Do you have any moving violations? No. Do you drink on the job? No. Do you ever hit anybody? On a job? Yeah. I don't think so. All right, then. We don't have nothing to worry about. If we jump to the Irishman, I'm going to fire some stats at you. 309 scenes, 108 days, 117 locations, involving two to three moves a day, carrying nine cameras at times, and these cameras could have three lenses on them. Yes. For the special CGI work yes, required. Yes, the computer generated. The yeah. ILM technique. Do you think this is the biggest film you've ever done? Uh, not intentionally. Hi, Frank. Would you like to be a part of history? Yes, I would. What else do you say? 
Now's not the time to not say. No doubt. Uh, I think prob probably even more than the CGI, it was all the different locations. Of course. And that's something I've always worked with in Goodfellas in many locations, in Casino, yeah. and uh, that sort of thing. So this was something that was planned. Mm -hmm. uh, we went in uh, knowingly. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> And why did you go back? Why did you decide that this was the film that was going to take you back to the world of mobsters and gangsters? Because you've said previously in your career that maybe you've had enough. What is it about this story that brought you back in? <laughs> Looking back, the last time Bob De Niro and I worked together was Casino. Well. It was 1995. Right around that time, we were talking about doing other kinds of films together. But he grew one way, I went another way. And whenever we'd meet, mm -hmm. we could not necessarily agree with each other's new projects. Mm -hmm. You follow? Uh, no, that's not for me, or maybe we should do something like this. And we kept working with other writers, different projects, different scripts, until finally it became a situation where we knew we had to deal with each other <laughs> again. Yeah. <laughs> we had to do it. Hello? Is that Frank? Yes. Hiya, Frank. This is Jimmy Hoffa. Yeah, yeah. Glad to meet you. Well, glad to meet you, too, even if it's over the phone. We started on another project called the... Uh, something about Frankie Machine. He then uh, received this book from Eric Roth, actually, mm -hmm. um, who was writing Good Shepherd for him at the time for the direct. Uh, I heard you paint houses. I heard you paint houses. Yes, yes, sir, I, I do, I do. And I, uh, I also do my own carpentry. When he described the character to me, became very, very involved with this story. And I saw an emotional connection that I said, that there's a kind of truth that we could get at. And if we mine that, years have gone by, of course, in our lives, but if we could touch upon that relationship that we had back in the past, once again, mm -hmm. at the age of 74, 75, whatever, mm -hmm. it might really be worth it. I never waited for anyone who was late more than 10 minutes in my life. I'd say 15, 15, right? No, 10. I'd also like to compliment you that this film is 3 hours 20. 3.20, I think, including those titles, which go, which I'm still working on, by the way. Oh, really? Yeah, I have to fix something at the end. I forgot to, a few things. I love that we live in a world where people are worried about everyone having such a small attention span, and you step up to the plate and go, no. No, no, please, please, take your time. <laughs> no, in the sense, maybe it's not, you know, maybe a lot of people won't go for that sort of thing, but I think if you invest the time, it might be, enriching to your life, I think, whether you agree with the story or not. Mm -hmm. But it might be interesting to make you see, to take the time to see and let the resonance carry. Yep. Uh, and I hope um, it's really important in this, in our time now, to focus, to focus. Yes. That's an important thing. Uh, and to ignore the mess, to push that away and focus. Maybe it could sit. Actually, what? You watch something on television for three or four hours straight. Yeah. So why not? It can be go done. Go to a theater, relax. If you've got a nice theater, nice seats, and just go. Yeah. Go with it. Let us take you into that world. Mm. Um, almost like a contemplation. Can I ask about this general conversation people are having about the decline of, of cinema generally, that there aren't enough films out there that really illuminate the soul? Mm -hmm. And I'd like to ask you what filmmakers and films that you've watched relatively recently that still inspire you and give you hope for the next wave of filmmakers? It's hard for me to, to keep up with a lot, but Joanna Hogg's films, for example, mm -hmm. I like uh, some of the wildness of the Ben Wheatley pictures. There are so many coming out of England, I think, Lynn Ramsey. There, there are really a number of uh, wonderful films. My, my fear, more than fear, my observation is that uh, the filmmakers of substance need support. Yeah. And the problem is um, the uh, amusement park films. The problem is that, which is something that's been pointed out for the past number of years now. But now I think, uh, in effect, uh, they, they've got real cinema on the run, so to speak. There's no, it's very difficult for films of substance or attempted, uh, how should I say? I don't want to use the word personal vision, but I have. Uh, it doesn't mean it's not entertaining, right? But uh, these, these projects, uh, uh, where can they be shown? Mm. Where can they be shown if the theaters are taken over by the um, uh, well-made, uh, beautifully made, uh, animated pictures, in a sense? Uh, you know? Uh, animated pictures. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not, I was thinking, I was saying this in, in New York, and uh, people were saying, well, you know, you don't like those films. It's not that I don't like them. First of all, I haven't seen many. I tried to. 
but I, I wasn't interested. Uh, the thing about it is that they seem to be creating, it's another form. Mm. It's another form. And their theaters were almost like amusement parks in a sense. So these films now, I think, are more like theme rides in a way. And it's a different experience for an audience. Now, that audience could also appreciate narrative film. Mm -hmm. uh, narrative or a narrative could be a film that could be made by the, uh, the Turkish filmmaker Ceylon or, or, as I say, Joanna Hogg, uh, or, or uh, you know, uh, different types of pictures um, that don't necessarily depend on uh, heavy special effects and, uh, 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 how should I put it, comic book heroes. I mean, I was told by my film professor, there are films and there are movies, and sometimes you've got to know what you're walking into. Yeah. See, but I come from a time where movies were films. Now, some were genre, you follow? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Years later, we realized, well, within the genre, mm -hmm. certain things were able to be expressed, certain uh, personal uh, style developed, not all the time, but very often. And then one could appreciate the genre for what it is. And that's what I'm saying about the, uh, the uh, theme park films. For what they are, they can be appreciated. But that's not the only thing. Yes. You follow? Okay. And we have, it's our obligation to, to uh, try to um, make that clear mm -hmm. to that audience. I want to ask you a couple of quick fire questions as we've got to wrap it up soon, but what mementos from all of the films that you've made have made it back? A little uh, EMS truck from Bringing Out the Dead. It was a very special film for me. Mm -hmm. Right after that, uh, my youngest daughter was born. Mm -hmm. So that was a very special time. The uh, sword cross that Liam Neeson used in the opening sequence of uh, Gangs of New York. You plague our people at every turn. But from this day out, you shall plague us no more. For let it be known that the hand that tries to strike us from this land shall be swiftly cut down. And the red shoes, which I didn't direct. But they are the red shoes, signed by Helpman, Shera, and Masim. So where are they? Somewhere in the house. What's happened is that we've taken over some of the rooms to make editing facilities. So uh, the red shoes have to be protected. <laughs> I'd agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> I've got to wrap this up. I'm getting the signal. <laughs> Sir, it has been such an honor and such a pleasure. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe and click the bell icon to keep up to date. You can listen to my Radio 1 movies and TV podcast screen time on BBC Sounds. And you can find these interviews in full on BBC iPlayer by searching Movies with Ali Plum.